Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast, Steve. It's a pleasure to have you back on the show. It's been, what, almost a year, I think, now since you last were on? Oh, Robbie, when it's been a year, mate, it feels just like a day. How are you, mate? Good to see you. <laughs> it's good to see you, man. I wanted to have you back on to talk about a couple of things that I'm sure we're going to get into, but through looking like you're obviously with your Spartan History podcast, do you ever get tired of it a little bit, just talking about Spartan History and just kind of focusing in, or are you always finding something interesting and new? The problem is with Sparta is that it's, and I think we've discussed this before, that there's, you know, there's two Spartas. There's the Sparta that everybody sort of knows and loves, you know, from the movies 300 and, you know, that sort of popular perception. But then there's the, I guess the, for lack of a better term, the real Sparta. And the problem is with the real Sparta, it's just a, it's just myth, it's legend, it's hearsay, it's, uh, you know, it's barely extant sort of uh, literature that's come down to us. So the historical thought on Sparta is, is constantly changing, it's constantly adapting, and it's really open to interpretation. You know, given a set of facts, historians have different um, perceptions on how it went. So in answer to the question, no, not really. I, the, the struggle I have with continuing the show is is doing it justice, you know, like, as I mentioned, there are those people that are really super passionate about Sparta. So you want to be sure to you know look after you know their thoughts and emotions and the things that they want from a show about Sparta. But you've also got to balance that, I guess, with um, you know historical fact and accuracy. So finding the balance in there can be very very tough. And I've run into some periods of time where I've really struggled to sort of move forward with the show and try to because you want you want to put forward a narrative, right? You want to put part part of picture. And I've really struggled sometimes just to get the the right balance between those two sides of Sparta. So not bored. A little bit, a um, little bit scared, a little bit nervous of moving forward, but no, I never bored of talking about Sparta. Would you say you've split off into the category of historian? Like, I'm not a historian of like the Kennedy assassination that I've been really focused into, but I damn know well more than a lot of the public does. And I kind of am looking at history now, and I start going, "What is exactly given to people?" It's like, "Here's the cliff notes of what you need to know." Compared to like, if you dive deeper, you notice a whole different story. Like you were mentioning the Spartan history. Yeah, mate. Yeah, I mean. Uh... <laughs> Historians are, you know, it's a loaded term. I mean, what is a historian? I mean, I guess it's, you know, if you go to the university, you do an arts degree, you get a degree in ancient history, you're a historian academically. But, you know, for somebody like yourself who's, you know, spent countless hours delving into the topic of, you know, JFK's assassination, for example, in your case, you know, you're as you're as good as it gets as a historian. Now, a historian is just a person that can, you know, assimilate all the facts and and spit out a, a narrative or a, a set of suppositions that that makes sense at the end of the day. But because we're not there, you know, you could you could live tomorrow and you can tell me exactly what happened to that with with certainty but as far as casting yourself back you know 50 60 years to kennedy or two and a half thousand years back to sparta that's open to interpretation so uh, I, I think i just consider myself a bit of a, a bit of a fan somebody who's very passionate about history and you know my show is a chronological show you know i don't i don't just go for the battle of Plataea, the battle of thermopylae you know i go right back to the start where i cover things not many people have ever really discussed on a podcast before in fact i'd say that nobody's really discussed some of the things that i've discussed on a podcast so i really get i really get a lot out of just overturning those stones that are sort of just left there sitting on the riverbed without anybody disturbing. That's where I get the real passion for the show. Do you think a lot of people just talk about the topics that are probably the most interesting or the ones, the points that people of the general public who might not be looking for any Spartan stuff, but might hear it in like a education class or something in their educational career, whatever they're doing. Um, I mean, school history, for instance, they taught a little bit about Sparta, but it was just the main giant things that obviously that they people, should probably know about but when you're picking every single thing you find that you're giving the public a better education than maybe something that would just hit specific moments i mean anybody can look up the battle of whatever troy whatever you want to say and be like okay i know this and now here's a podcast all on it but what about if you come across a battle that wasn't taught and then it is very very interesting and people just got to see that it is interesting yeah exactly i mean yeah like you said i mean you could type in you know to google podcast on sparta and i could promise you that every single podcast that would come up would, would be on at least probably if not one maybe two facets of of ancient sparta but you know it's it's all interesting to me and i think if you can you know do the work and you know what that's like as a podcast you know you, you put in the work you put in the effort and you can sort of produce something that's that's you know that's considerate in its um in its sort of in the in the outset and it's also you know well thought through and it's sort of it's got a bit of death to it a little bit of meat on that bone then you can really make any topic interesting and that's our job as a podcaster is to be able to you know really get at the finer points of the topic and and deliver that in a way that people are going to engage with it and i think you know people give that that sort of give the other opportunity then they too can get interested in too but you know what it's like you sit through history class i mean it wasn't for me i absolutely loved history but i can appreciate for where people are coming from on topics that 
have no interest to me, like geography, for example. In class, I was only interested in, okay, that's a mountain, that's a hill, that's the difference between the two and you move on. But I'm sure that there's there's nuances there and there's finer points to geography that I'm just missing because I'm not interested in it. History is like that for a lot of people, you know, they want the they want the snappy things. They want, oh, there was a battle of a thousand people here and they all died tragically and there was a hero that conquered all and saved the kingdom and rescued the princess and lived happily ever after. That's sort of the, the take on history that most people get to. So it's up to you know, myself as a history podcaster to be able to give them a bit of story, give them a narrative they can buy into. Through your research though, would you say that history is being taught well when it comes to the Spartans and it comes into the, how the general public is receiving it? Because I think everyone at this point just thinks they're like bloodthirsty savages. Uh, not as much as barbarians, but you know they were all about war. They were all about ba- battling. They were all about fighting. They're the strongest army. But I would feel like, yeah, but were they literate? Were they able to read and write good? Were they religious at all? That's never been something I don't think we've ever talked about. Yeah, mate, that's that's really well put. Yeah, and 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 you're right. Yeah, no, I don't think that they've been taught well by history. And I mean, the Spartan history, for better or for worse, has been taught through you know the popular medium of of TV, of movies, where you know you see these muscle bound warriors, you know standing against you know vast odds and, and, and sandals conquering all. always sandals sandals you know and like six packs they've all got six packs and that sort of stuff you know i mean the the image itself is is completely and utterly false you know spartans they've got a on a very sparse diet of food you know and, and muscle-bound warriors you know they, they burn out too quick you know the spartans need to be able to fight for days and days and days on end you know like the a better image would be a bunch of really wiry guys you know really thinly muscled but the, they have the endurance that they can go on and on and on. And yeah, they have the, you know, the impression of austerity as well. Like, you know, that they, there was no money in Sparta. They were all poor. They just, they live soldierly lives. None of that's really true. You know, that like any society, you know, communism is a good example. Communism, oh, we're all equal. You know, we're all sons of the fatherland. We're all doing exactly the same thing. Sparta was like that in a sense too, that, you know, there was this image of equality, but there was vast differences in, in wealth and privilege and position within Sparta as well. So no, the popular mechanism for teaching Sparta has done a very, very bad job, but that doesn't mean the story isn't isn't very deep and very enjoyable to get into. And um, you know, they were exceptional; they just weren't exceptional in the way that that we probably popularly perceive them to be. Now, when it comes to them being literate, were any of them literate? Like poetry, not just the men, religion. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah. I mean, not just the men, but um, also the women, which was um, you know very uncommon in ancient Greece. I mean, the other great city in ancient Greece being Athens, um, who, you know, you're always going to use as a bit of a counterpoint towards Sparta when you're having discussions about ancient Greece. You know, the women in Athens were completely illiterate. You know, they were housebound slaves for, for lack of a bit of a term. You know, it would have been would have been a situation of the greatest offense if a an Athenian man would have been hearing about his wife being spoken about an unrelated company. That would have been a tragedy, whereas Spartan women were not only educated, uh, they were trained through physical exercise because the, th- the thought was that you know strong mothers give birth to, to strong children. While the men were away fighting, which they often were, the Spartan women were in charge of the households. They were in charge of the properties. You know, Spartans had vast estates. Um, you know, with with slaves that were farming the well, the helots who were, I guess, chattel slaves, um, serfs for lack of a better term, um, were farming the land. So the Spartan women were in charge of all that. So they were. Con- incredibly emancipated as far as ancient Greek women go and very literate. And Spartans had had poets. Uh, a famous Spartan poet was Tertius, who lived in the, the seventh century. And he um, wrote a series of, of war poems. There was a big war going on at the time between the, the Spartan and their neighbors and they, they weren't doing so well. So Tertius's poems were designed to instill a military spirit. It was all about, you know, standing forward, standing next to the man beside you to not run away, to turn your back on the enemy would have been a terrible thing. So they had that poetry, they had art, they had, uh, you know, they had buildings of, of reasonable beauty, gold statues within Sparta, these things you don't ever hear about in the popular narrative. When they left to go to war, the Spartans, did any, did any of them stay behind to protect the women or was it just the women by themselves? Yeah, that's a that's a good point. And you know, the Spart the best way to think about Sparta, and it was noted by a uh, by an ancient historian, was that Sparta itself was like a military camp. You know, you had a population of um, indentured servant slaves, the helots, that roughly outnumbered the Spartans by ten to one. So, you know, they were looking for any opportunity to to throw off the yoke and and rise up in revolt, and they did that on numerous occasions. So, you know, it wasn't a great idea for the Spartans to completely divest their territory of of military. Uh, soldiers and at, at most there would have been about eight thousand Spartans at the height around about the fifth century, and they went steadily in decline after that. But we'll take the Battle of Plataea, for example, which was uh, um, a massive battle in four seven nine against the the Persian forces. It was the year after Thermopylae, and um, 
you know, there was no greater threat to ancient Greece. And, you know, the Spartans were the, the military leaders of Greece, you know. But rather than send the full 8,000 troops, they only sent 5,000. So they have 3,000 at home, but not just that. Herodotus writes, that's the historian for the, for the Greco-Persian Wars, that they took 35,000 Helot slaves with them. So they basically moved the prison camp with them on campaign and used them as uh, light infantry, as uh, you know, servants to carry food and water and things like that around. So you know, they were succinctly aware of the danger that the Helots placed. And indeed, um, about 20 years after in 464 BCE, there was a massive earthquake in Sparta, and that was all it took for the Helots to rise up and revolt. And it took them a good five or six years to bring that back under control. So yeah, they, were, they were conscious of the danger they left behind them. They were, they were literally, they had a wolf by the throat, so to speak. Do they have a rite of passage for a servant to become a Spartan, or is that just a rite of passage from a child to become a Spartan? Like, I feel like that would limit your army size. You know, if you lose a thousand people or something like that in one of these wars, then what? You have to, you're down numbers until the kids grow up and they're able to join the forces? Happened to, happened a lot. I mean, you know, we're looking at battles that, you know, would occur every generation or so. And that was generally the reason why um, the Spartans fought a battle against the Argives, who were another. Greek city state and the polis in the Peloponnese, a very uh, a city that had a lot of uh, history, especially in the Bronze Age. You know, some of the great heroes of the Iliad came from Argos. So it was a, it was an important city. They fought the Battle of Sepia against the Argives in four nine four, and they reportedly slew six thousand of their hoplites, their their premium soldiers. Now this knocked Argos out of any war for a generation, and the Argives infamously Medais. They went over to the Persian side during the Greco Persian Wars, but they weren't an issue to Sparta, even though that they were effectively next door to them in the Peloponnese. So Sparta could still leave and fight the Persians and the Argives were an issue because the flower of their youth had gone. But um, yeah, the Spartans, there definitely was a rite of passage. Um, the boys were taken from their homes at about five or six and they were enlisted in what was called the agogi, which was a, um, in, in Greek and ancient Greek, it means the raising. I guess if you were to refer to how you'd rear a, a calf to become a cattle, that was probably the best way to interpret the word agogi. It's literally the raising of cattle, and that's the right way to perceive how the Spartans thought of their youth. They were they were animals for the for the war machine that would become Sparta. And yeah, the rite of passage lasted until they were, well, effectively thirty. Um, but they lived in they lived in barracks at least until they were thirty. But they graduated from the agogi at about between eighteen and twenty, um, and they could marry at around twenty. But they still couldn't live with their wife until they were thirty. They still lived in that barracks culture. So. That was the the secret of uh, Spartan success on the battlefield. It was how homogenous they were in action. You know, they, these guys, the, the person standing behind you, or beside you, behind you, in front of you in the phalanx was quite literally your, your campmate from the age of five or six. You knew these people intuitively. Um, not just that, you know, your reputation depended on their good graces as well. So, and, and, and theirs on yours. So you wouldn't want to let them down in combat and things like that. So the, the cohesion of the Spartan army came from the agogi. So it was all about, from, from almost from birth, the Spartans were destined to become warriors of the state. But getting to your point of the reduction of, um, of population size, it was a big problem for Sparta. You didn't just have to go through the agogi, you also had to have a plot of land. And you can imagine if you're a father and you had two sons and both of them were the agogi, but when you passed away, you had to pass on your land to them. But if you split the land, they didn't have enough land to qualify as a full Spartan anymore too. So this, and then obviously daughters could inherit, they'd accumulate more land. So this is what led to the Spartan decline in the fourth century. The term in Greek is oliganthropia, which basically means um, a stagnant, a stagnancy of the nobility. So more and more land was accumulated through less and less people and less and less people qualified to be full Spartan citizens after that. Do you think that's an interesting relationship? Like, who do you think they valued more? The Spartans valued their military more, or do you think they valued their women or their children? I would have to think that if you're bunkmates with these people and you basically fight and battle with them, that you would probably develop a tighter relationship than you would and say, how many times you go to, out to battle, you leave your wife and kid behind. I mean, you know, it's, it's actually, it's, it's a good point you raise again. I mean, um, if, for, for a Spartan, bringing a son, at least one son into the world was, was, a, was more of an affair of state rather than an affair of affection with your partner. Um, King Leonidas, Leonidas, when he famously went off to fight in Thermopylae, he took 300 Spartans with him, as the legend goes, the, the 300. But every one of those Spartans had a son so that they could pass on the land because Leonidas, you know, we, we assume he knew that he was not going to come back with any of those troops. Um, but, you know, it was important to be able to pass that land on to, you know, refill the, the, the troop lod, um, ledger more or less in the day. But there's an interesting um, 
tradition in Sparta, getting back to, you know, they spend a lot of time with men, you know, did they like men more than they liked women? Um, and homosexuality was a, was a practice in, in ancient Greece and particularly in Sparta and you know, state-sponsored pedophilia it was as well. Uh, but when a Spartan married a woman, there was a very interesting um, thing that occurred whereby they would shave the woman's hair and dress her in a man's robe when they would take her into um, be with her husband the first night. And the thought was that because the Spartan had lived all his time with men, the sight of a woman would be a little bit distressing and he wouldn't be able to uh, perform. perform, I guess. So they, uh, you know, shaved her head and dressed her up like a man so that they could, uh, you know, commit the conjugal yeah. rights on the night Back of Back uh, before the marriage. ages of uh, Viagra. That's what's... That's what... <laughs> <laughs> a Greek, Greek red wine is pretty good too, Robbie. Do you think uh, so? With like Leonidas taking three hundred, do you really think that he didn't know he was going to make it back alive? Yeah, that makes a lot more sense. But also, that's where I say the movie kind of depiction of that shows that everyone thinks that's all the Spartans. You know what I mean? When you start saying there's ten thousand and there's eight thousand and there's that's like nothing to what you know I've seen. And obviously, I'm using movies, so you can't take it for like maybe a hundred percent accuracy. But you're kind of looking at it like, I mean, if he. I would think he, think he had the confidence, but maybe if you really think about the numbers that they do have, if someone does take a small amount of people out there, maybe they know it's going to be a loss, but they also can't back down because what does that make them look like to their enemies? Yeah, precisely. And I know I, I think um, I, sp I spoke about this in my podcast on Thermopylae, and I think Leonidas knew exactly what he was doing there. You know, I mean, we don't hear of any other uh, battle where the Spartans committed troops where they ensured that everyone that was going on campaign had a son. And, and to be fair on the, the rest of the Greeks, it wasn't just the 300 Spartans at Thermopylae. There was about 8,000 other allied Greeks that were there. But on the final day, on the third day, and this is after the Persians had had turned the pass of Thermopylae, they'd um, been betrayed, or the Greeks had been betrayed by a, by a local from the area, um, Ephilates, who let the Persians know that there was a path up around the mountain ridge of Thermopylae. So Thermopylae is a very tight little mountain pass along the coast there. So he, he guided the Persians around there. So on the third day, the Spartans were well aware that the Persians were not just coming from behind, they were coming from the front. And they knew that they were absolutely doomed. Now, Leonidas sent everybody else home except for the Spartans. And there was maybe 100, 120 of them left by this stage. So whether he knew it before he marched to Thermopylae, he certainly made the decision uh, on the last day there to sacrifice not just himself, but also the Spartans. And I think in his head, he knew that this was going to galvanize Greek resistance, and it certainly did. Have you came across in your writings about Spartans from other, uh, not countries, from other civilizations or other cities that talked about the strength of Sparta? I mean, like Athens was taught to me in school through just being like this very wealthy, very high class, I me mean, just seem like the elite class style type city. But then you, I mean, you can probably dive into it more and pull apart that narrative easily. But when you talk about the Spartans, they're just kind of savage and they burned out quick. So I'm wondering if there was any writings and, you know, history is written by the winner. So I would think that, you know, if Athens won or, you know, I would think that, yeah, they make themselves look really, really good. So I'm always kind of questioning these narratives now. And it's hard not to look at something and see somebody's narrative in it now, especially when you start trying to look for it more. Now, with Athens, I'm curious if any civilizations out there, either the Persians, whoever that might have fought or come in contact with the Spartans, had had any writing on the Spartans, and at least any good stuff to write, or is it just mostly just brutal bad stuff? Well, to answer your question about Athens first, yeah, I mean, you're, you're right that it's surprising that we have such a, I guess, a positive outlook on, on the Spartans of the 5th and 4th century, considering everything we have from the Greek sources comes from either Athenians or, or pro-Athenian voices. And, and look, the vast majority of Greek history is, is Athenocentric uh, in nature. So it's, you know, it's, it's coming from that, that little corner of Attica, which was about 120 miles away from Sparta. Um, that, that being said, Herodotus, who was from Halicarnassus, which is in the um, southwestern corner of Turkey, he wrote the great history of the Greco-Persian Wars, but he spent a lot of time in Athens and he was very pro-Athenian. Even he had to give credit to where to where the Spartans were, and and he gave them the lion's share of uh, the reason why the Greeks ultimately won the Greco-Persian War. The other source we have is Thucydides, who wrote um, about the Peloponnesian War, or as I like to call it, the the Delian War. But he wrote it's called the Peloponnesian War because the Athens was fighting against the Peloponnesian League, of which Sparta was the leader. Uh, even he was begrudging. He was one of the generals. He actually fought against Sparta uh, in the war and was bested by by one of the generals named Brasidas. Even he was very very um, generous in his praise of the Spartans. But as far as external sources go of the time when they were at their uh, preeminence, there's nothing. Um, perhaps the Persians did write 
uh, something about them. We get some anecdotes from Herodotus and Herodotus would have been uh, able to talk to people who had lived in Persia or descended from some of the Persians that were around in those days. He was writing some 60 years after the, after the events there, but nothing survives the Persians and everything else we have um, from other sources, say, say for the Romans, for example, none of it's contemporaneous with Sparta. You know, they're all fantasizing about a Sparta that had long since ceased to exist. Indeed, when Plutarch, who was a, he was a Greek, but he was a Roman um, politician, was writing his famous work called The Parallel Lives in his day and age, which was in the first first or second century AD, uh, Sparta was a tourist attraction to Romans. You know, Romans could go to Sparta and they could watch young boys being whipped like they were going through the agogi still. But Sparta had long since been, you know, a city of power. It was just a little blip on the map that people would go and see, oh, wow, this is where the Spartans came from. So no, we really don't have anything, mate. That's really interesting that the Romans were interested in Sparta. I would feel like with their city and everything that they have going on, is it just from maybe a restrictive aspect to it is why they like going and seeing people get whipped? because they can't have that in their own city? Look, the Spartans were, you know, I saw the Spartans, the Romans were, you know, incredibly powerful by this stage. I mean, in about 160 BCE, Rome conquered Greece effectively. And from that time forward, Greece was just a province of Rome. You know, there wasn't Athens or Sparta, it was Archaea, um, which was their collective name of the province there. So rich Romans, affluent Romans, you know, like to go on tour, like you and I like to go on holidays now. We go and see the sites and things like Sparta was just one of those sites on the maps. They'd go to Athens and they'd see the Acropolis, they'd see the Parthenon, they'd go to Sparta, they'd watch some some boys being whipped in the, the ancient whipping rit ritual. Uh, they'd travel, go to the, the old Persian Empire, they would have stayed at Persepolis, the the, the the palace of, of Xerxes and Darius and the Archaemenid kings. It was just one of those places on the map that they wouldn't get, went to go and see. And obviously, like any tourist attraction you go to now, there's people there looking to earn some money. You know, come here, pay pay me five denarii and you can watch some boys being whipped. Oh, great. You know, that's, you, know, you can see them now eating whatever the first century version of popcorn was while they were watching. This leads into the question I asked you about that I want to talk about, which was the Rome Coliseum. But I would think that if you have a thing like that, you wouldn't be looking for entertainment anywhere else, even if it's outside to other cities. I mean, that was the whole point of the thing, it seemed like, was just watch people fight to the death. Yeah, the Coliseum. Um, and look, yeah, like I said earlier on, thanks for, for uh, getting me on to talk a little bit about Rome. It's, um, it's, a, it's a real passion of mine. So it takes look, the first me a little thing bit when to know... I get there. <laughs> no, I knew, I, I, knew, I knew we were getting there eventually. Look, the first thing we need to know about the Coliseum was that if you went to Rome of the first or the second century, third century, fourth century, and said, you know, where is the Colosseum? If you could speak Latin, um, people wouldn't have a clue what you were talking about. The Colosseum is named the Colosseum because of a large statue that uh, that Nero constructed, Emperor Nero constructed, which was a bronze colossal statue uh, of himself, which they later um, changed the head on to look like the god Sol Invictus. Now, this statue was outside of what we call the Colosseum. Now, because the statue was the Colossus, and just through time and the way that the world works and the way medieval society works, that people associated the Colosseum with the Colossus statue. So that's how it got its name. But the actual name of the, the Colosseum, if you were saying the first century when it was constructed, was the Amphiatron Flavian. So the Flavian, Amphiatron Amphitheater, Flavian is the emperor of the dynasty, sorry, that um, that constructed it. Now, to get to the Let's get to the story of the Colosseum. We've got to sort of go back a little bit. So where the Colosseum is constructed, uh, it's on a, on what would have been a very heavily populated area within central Rome, somewhere on a flat plain between the, the Palatine, the Caelian, and the Esquiline Hills. Rome had seven the city of seven hills, famously. These hills were, were prominent to the center of the city, and it was covered in houses and insulas, uh, like, basically like, um, what would you call it, America? Uh, condos, condominiums. Um, now in 64 AD, under the reign of Emperor Nero, there was a massive fire in Rome. Now this is the fire that everybody says that, you know, Nero fiddled while Rome burned. Now, of course, Nero didn't fiddle because the, the fiddle wasn't invented back then, but perhaps he plucked the lyre. And from all uh, reports, he was quite good at the lyre. Now this fire wiped out a massive section of Rome and rather than reconstruct the houses for the citizens, Nero had it leveled and he built what was called the Domus Aurea, which means the golden house. And it was just this massive bloody palace in the middle of Rome that was dedicated to Nero. And he built a giant statue called the Colossus, which sat out the front of it. Anyway, time goes by, Nero, because he's vastly unpopular, not just because of the house, because he's, you know, he's he got an ego lost issue. his mind. He had some he had some pretty big issues. Yeah, but but he was apparently a very good actor and he was a very good musician as well. He, had, he did have some things going for him, but he never should have been emperor. Um, 
there was a revolt in the Jewish provinces um, in what's today Israel now. And a general was called in to squash this revolt. And his name was Vespasianus. And his uh, Vespasian, sorry. And his dynasty, his family name was Flavian. Anyway, 69 comes around, the Jewish revolt's still going. Vespasian is killing Jews as, as he did back then. And Nero commits suicide uh, because some of his generals start rising in revolt. This is in 68, 69. So they call 69 AD the year of the four emperors. So Galba, Galba was a, a, a Roman general from the Spanish provinces. He rose up first. Um, Nero's like, oh my God, what can I do? Everybody else started rising up in revolt. So Nero killed himself. And his famous last words were, you know, what an artist the world loses in me. Anyway, Galba rises up. Otho rises up as well. Otho kills Galba. Vitilius rises up. Vitilius kills Otho. And now Vitilius is there. And some of Otho's friends were looking for another option. So they went to Vespasian and they got him to also nominate himself as emperor. So then Vespasian comes back to Rome and kills Vitilius. So he wants to start up a new dynasty. You've got to understand that this was a really important time in Rome. Up until that point, Nero was the last of the Julian Claudian emperors. So his dynasty could be traced back to Julius Caesar himself. So now Rome's like, what's going on? They've never known an emperor that wasn't descended from Julius Caesar. So Vespasian needs to do something about this. So um, with the great fire, so the Romans were disgusted with Nero, absolutely hated him, and they hated the golden palace that he built. So Vespasian ordered it all be torn down, leveled off, and he constructed the amphitheater in that place. The construction started in 70 AD. It's a little bit ironic that he constructed an amphitheater based on how it was Nero's house and he was an artist and he killed himself. But the thing is that so Nero's house was built for himself. It was for his own narcissism, whereas Vespasian built an amphitheater that had free entry for all Romans to come to. It was his way of saying, I give this to the city of Rome. You know, it was a, and it was a beautiful building. Like you've never seen anything quite, or Rome had never seen anything quite like it. I mean, there weren't a lot of, structures that were dedicated to um, to theater, to gladiatorial combat prior to this. And this was the largest that was ever constructed in Rome. Um, I've got the measurements written down here and I've changed it into feet for you, but the, um, the total structure was 615 foot long and 510 foot wide. And at its highest, it was 150 foot high. Um, so there was just something like you've, you've never seen before. It was constructed out of travertine marble, so it would have glistened in the morning sun. And it had three different tiers for the different sort of um, grade of guests, where there was obviously the, the very rich at the bottom, the, the middle class next up, and then the, the plebeians, the, the peasants were at top. And the actual, the arena, now the, we get the word arena from the uh, Roman word for sand, which is harina. So the arena in the middle, which was um, covered in sand, hence the term arena, was 272 foot by 152 foot. And it had 80 different shafts that went down to the hippogeum, which is the underneath sort of um, the channels where all the soldiers and the animals could marshal that could transport people immediately up to the surface from there. So the, the, the construction took about 10 years. And when it was inaugurated in 80 AD, there was games, which was at this stage done by Titus because Vespasian had died the year before. So the construction was completed by Titus, his son. Um, the games that they were held, held at that stage were written as the greatest games that Rome had ever seen up until that point. Now, was it largely more theatrical or was there a purpose to that? Like, would they do executions there or was it like gladiator matches? I mean, what about dramas and theaters? I mean, which one did they focus more on? Yeah, look, the, the, not so much. Like they would have definitely had some theatrical performances. In it's there, synonymous but... with gladiators. I just, from what I've been taught and what I think history teaches. Yeah, I think, well, if you look down, we'll say the, we'll, we'll take the ADAD games with the, the inaugural games, I suppose. Um, they went on for several several months. Uh, I think it was about 120 days of games in continuous in, in concert. And every day would have started roughly the same. They would have had uh, animal hunts in there. And, you know, Rome at this point was almost at its at the zenith of its power. You know, it encompassed Northern Africa, all the way up to Britain, all of France, a fair good chunk of Germany, right across to, uh, to Syria. Um, and bordering up on Iran there. So the animals that they could pull in there, you know, you could have lions from Northern Africa, you know, elephants would be down there, gazelles, monkeys, all these different sorts of creatures. So most days would start the same. There would be some sort of hunting uh, expose within there with, you know, different exotic animals released for the um, amusement of the crowd. And they would have been, you know, shot down with javelins or, uh, or bows and arrows for the most part. And usually the middle of the day, they'd have executions. You know, the Romans loved nothing more than a, than a good execution. So there was likely uh crucifixions going on um especially for some of the christian people like there was 
pretty famous for uh, for a lot of Martha and for the Christians there. And that would happen during the middle of the day. And in the afternoon, as the sun sort of you know went over the peak of the of the Colosseum, then the gladiators would come out and they would fight and there'd be mock battles. You know, they could actually fill the Colosseum with water as well. So they could have, you know, naval combat in there too. They'd have, you know, mock battles like the Gauls fighting the Romans, the Greeks fighting the Persians, these sorts of things. And um, that's basically how every day would carry on. They had crucifixions around noon, like middle of the day. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I'm not I just sure ate breakfast. I don't is. have time for this. <laughs> well, the Romans didn't eat breakfast, but well, that's, that's probably a story for well, not not breakfast as we know it anyway. Yeah. What just had water and berries or something? Yeah, mostly. Mostly, the the big meal happened as the sun was going down. That's where they you know they dined. The feast. Yeah, the feast. Yeah, yeah, and and it was the same for for Greece as well. The Greek the Romans took a lot of their um you know cultural ideas in that regard from the Greeks. So yeah, the the big meal was at at sort of in the afternoon into early evening, and it could go on for four or five hours. Do you think, like, is there anyone out there that had any threats to the Colosseum that just didn't like the idea of having something in there that could be so brutal? I mean, try and switch the direction of which way it's going to go. I would have to feel like a lot of people accepted the whole gladiator combat thing and the whole fighting aspect of stuff. But the Colosseum, I mean, once you start getting into, like, what was going on there, it's not really a place of, like, happiness and joy when it comes into uh, the morals that we have today. But back then it was, I guess, a different form of entertainment, no TV. Yeah, well, I mean, that was that was always the rule of the emperor, right? You know, you got to give the people bread and games, bread and circuses. No, the Romans loved it. They were they were bloodthirsty. You know, they were bellicose in their operation, and it served the function of keeping the populace um, obviously placated, so they were calm. You know, they could always have you know free games to go to, and there's always largesse handed out. You know, bread and cakes and wine and meat and things like that. But the Romans absolutely loved the bloodshed. You know, they 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 enjoyed it. They expected it even. It wasn't until Rome and the Greater Roman Empire started becoming a little bit more Christian into the third and into the fourth century in particular that um, I guess just due to the morals of the of the you know Catholic faith or Christian faith that it just wasn't accepted anymore. But you know, for a good four hundred years and and you know for hundreds of years before uh, the Colosseum was constructed, the Romans you know. They, they loved their gladiatorial combat and and they needed to, you know, they needed to be inured to blood because, you know, it was a Roman's responsibility to serve in the army and go off to far-flung pur purposes and spill blood for the empire. So was it ever a training arena, like just to be able to train some troops or was it just strictly just for games? Not directly, although the the luduses, which were the, the gladiatorial schools, were often situated very close, if not right next to uh, military camps. So the warriors that were in the legions, the legionnaires could receive training from the, the Lanastas, the, 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 I guess the heads of the, the Ludus and, and train with the gladiators as well. And, and certainly uh, when times were tough and soldiers were hard to come by, the Roman emperors weren't above, you know, buying a troop of gladiators to serve in their army and, um, you know, to serve as sort of an auxiliary force that happened very often. So yeah, it, you know, there was really no separation between the two in Roman life, the military, the games, the gladiators, even the name gladiator comes from the, uh, the word for the, the Roman sword, the legionnaires used the gladius. That's where the, the term gladiator comes from. Do you think with understanding Spartan history and Rome history, I mean, having all these facts, I mean, you rattled off like a historian, um, but understanding all this, do you think that, it, like, I mean, do you see similarities or do you think you have a deeper understanding of just people? I mean, a lot of things are kind of similar when it comes to like bread and circus today. But are you able to like notice a lot of stuff more modern texts? And also, do you think you understand people better? I mean, what amazes us? What gets us going? I mean, it's not that much different. Yeah, we're not killing each other, but there's still these interests. Like true crime is a form of that. I mean, it's like everyone's interested in murders and how stuff and a good story to it. So I'm just curious if you think that you're able to like, because I look at the Kennedy stuff and I can take something and be like, okay, this can still go on today. It's still matters today i'm wondering if you can do something with so far back that you still see maybe some notes of something from back then today yeah absolutely i mean there's what uh, i'm trying to think of the the american uh, mark twain now he wrote he wrote famously uh, i think it was at the turn of the 19th century that that although history doesn't repeat it often rhymes and it's you know that's that's a cute you know, little, little pithy phrase. And most people, when they're referring to the parallels between history and the modern time, will, will quote something similar. But look, I'm not caught up with academia. I haven't been indoctrinated into, you know, the, the typical line of history. I see parallels all the time. And I think, you know, if you look at the way society is uh, turning in on itself at the moment and getting caught up in identitarianism, um, you know, the, the, our, the, the, fab, the moral fabric of our society seems to be collapsing a little bit. There's, a, there's, there's sort of, you know, threats from here, there and everywhere around, particularly around what people would call morality. 
that was the Roman Empire, you know, in the, the third and fourth century. You know, now they had, I guess, Christianity to save their 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 moral fiber, but nothing could save their empire. And I often wonder, you know, what's what's going to save ours? And I mean, I haven't heard it made, but you could easily draw parallels between, say, Julius Caesar being assassinated and, and JFK being assassinated too. There's a lot to compare the two too. You know, they're both extremely popular, you know, the um with with the people. The institution of the day in Caesar's time, it was the uh, it was the you know the upper class citizens, the the Republican entrenched government uh, couldn't stand him. The same with with John F. Kennedy, you know the the deep states didn't like him, the military industrial complex didn't like him, the CIA didn't like him. There's a lot of comparatives there, and I mean it's 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 a fun game to play, but um, I, I absolutely think that there's you know tangents between ancient times and modern times. I think the biggest mistake people make, but is when they, from a future enlightened position like we are now, they cast judgment on people in history. And you see that with the toppling of, of statues, uh, which is what's happened in recent times. That, that to me is disgusting because the people in ancient times weren't looking forward to you know, the future when we were around and we were in our enlightened position and wondering how that they'd be judged. You know, they were dealing with the, the events and the, the systems that they had to hand. And I think most people were doing the best that they can were there some mistakes? There's still mistakes to this day and age. Everybody's human. You know, who's going to be there to topple our statues in 100 years' time? Do you think that we would have a better history and things wouldn't be so much left up to like their own narratives or perspectives if they didn't destroy a lot of the stuff that they had on there? I mean, the fact that people wrote stuff down, but I start to wonder, was it because we just were too focused on militarization like we are kind of today? But perhaps if we had more of a focus on philosophy and other things of writing stuff down and more of literature, will we have a better history record to be able to look at? You know, I understand writing and all this and when the time period of when all that comes in, but I have to look at things like I know plays and everything that we're creating. We can learn a lot from those. But I also start going with the statues. I mean, eventually statues got torn down from gods. People just lost their faith in them. And that is an issue if you're going to feel ramifications from gods. But it was a whole religion change. But then also we can't look back from the future now and look back at the past and be like, well, this was here. We got his ankles. You know, you don't have the full thing. And maybe it wouldn't have lasted that long. But you start looking at the number of things that they did destroy, books being burned, similar style, style stuff, which even if you don't agree – you should still kind of keep it around because it is important history. You can't just wipe something off the map. You have to look at it and then move on past it. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, pardon my French, but history doesn't give a shit, you know, what we think of it. You know, we can sit back and judge it all we like. You know, history is really just there to learn a lesson from, you know, so we don't make the same mistakes of the past. And if we try to rewrite it, well, we run into the into the the trap of, of so changing history that, that we don't even know what we're dealing with anymore. And we will make those mistakes again because we just think, oh no, no, we've we've blacked that out. It's it's you know, it's too triggering for people to understand. I mean, the, the greatest tragedy of history is is everything that we have lost. You know, and you know, there's various reasons for that, you know, lack of popularity, shifts in morals, shifts in desires and interests, um, you know, fires, earthquakes, destruction, ravaging, pillaging armies. But there's an estimate that we only really have perhaps about one or two percent of the material that was written down. Uh, say in the classical times or in the Hellenistic period or the Roman period, and you know the vast majority of it's just just been lost to the sands of history. And you know I, I do I do very much worry from there. And like most people who have an interest in history, whenever there's an ancient cache found in the sands of Egypt or something, everybody's like, oh my god, please may this be in there. You know we we, we can't wait to see what's there because you know what's missing is a yeah you know, 98 percent of the story that we just don't have now. I think recently a guy just found a book that's written on some like really old paper, but it's in gold writing, so they know it's legit. Actually, the Vatican is what the article is about. You know what I'm talking yeah, it's about? Yeah, isn't it? Yeah, yeah so it's yeah. like, yeah, that doesn't that change everything about what we've been going off of for the longest time? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, th that's that's happened several times throughout history. Um, there was there was some documents that were found um, in Pompeii in the 18th century, I believe, that you know we it was. Basically, I can't remember what the name of the villa was called, but it had the corpus of of Stoic philosophy in there, and we knew almost nothing of Stoic philosophers before we found that you know we could we could get at it by the writings of say Marcus Aurelius because his work, the Meditations, had come down to us, and we had a little bit of other writings from Seneca and people like that, but we had none of the real philosophy of of the foundation of the Stoic faith, Stoic philosophy. And when they found this villa in Pompeii, they found you know hundreds and hundreds of scrolls that were just you know crystallized in. The volcanic tufa and it just you know it opened up this whole segment of philosophy that nobody had ever come across before and it, it really sort of it, it galvanized the not not the not the reformation movement but definitely added to that impetus of of having another look at the scripture and trying to understand exactly what you know god jesus christ meant back then so yeah for sure we're, we're waiting for it 
if you examine the history of Rome, are you able to look at specific points to see when there was a certain event that would happen? Like not saying wars or battles or anything, but like there's a time of peace and then there's a time of just complete flare chaos. You know, if, are you able to look at anything and see any time periods like that where there was maybe a year of nothing going on and then there's just this giant flare up that started to happen? Because you, when you mentioned about the Colosseum being built for the people, I kind of start looking at it like, like I is that that has a purpose to it? What else has a purpose besides going to war? I mean, like, is there any other things that were specifically built that changed history because it had a purpose to it or it had some type of leaning of this was the motive behind doing this because this was going to get this. This was going to make the people stop bitching and get them to be like, accept you as an emperor. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, there's the, the the biggest one that stands out would be what was called the Pax Romana, which means the the Great Roman Peace, uh, and it was a you know, Rome was always at war, so let's not pretend like they were just, you know, sitting there not doing a great deal. But for roughly 200 years, Rome wasn't threatened by really any serious external contender from basically the time that that uh, Augustus put down Mark Antony and solidified his power in the Principate of Rome through to really the death of, of Commodus, the son of Marcus Aurelius. There was really nothing um, after that. And then they call it the crisis of the third century, where there, in 100 years, there was something like 50 or 60 emperors. And we, we really know little from that time. So we've got 200 years where everything was at peace. You know, the, the great, you know, writers, Suetonius, Seneca, um, the, you know, the, the great geographers and things like that were all coming about, the great poets, Marshall and people like that were all writing their, their, their work. And we've got a lot of that stuff come, come down to us now. But for a hundred years there in the third century, we've got almost nothing. We're relying on sources that were writing in the fifth or sixth century for that period of time. So yeah, absolutely. You know, when, when there's war, when there's chaos, when there's unrest, things don't go good for, for empires, for civilizations, whether it's ours now or the Romans 250,000 years ago. For some of your research, are you just going strictly off of like what historians have done? Like, are you looking at stuff from like history, like documents or whatever you can find when it comes to the actual history part? Because there's another side of history I started to learn when I was learning about the Great Depression on my show. I had an economist on here and he that's another side of history during the Great Depression. You can learn a lot from the economist angle. And I'm curious if there's any other angles rather than just looking at a history book or looking at documents and things of that sort from a historian's perspective. Could you analyze it from, I don't know, I wouldn't say people that live there, obviously, but people that have just walked around and been able to see landmarks or things of certain sorts and been able to look deeper into what those were when they were established and see how it kind of shaped and changed Rome. Mm, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, and you've got to get tricky. I mean, if we go back to the Spartans for a second, because there is so little writ written about them, um, and you know they weren't the greatest builders in the world. Um, indeed, you know, a, a famous historian said that you know posterity wouldn't believe the Spartans were as powerful as they were, judged by the the monuments they left behind. That is, they to seem say, like myth. Almost nothing. They seem like myth. They're, they basically were, you know, and and you know they were aware of that myth too. They 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 promoted that myth. You know, they wanted people to think that they were you know badasses, and they didn't you know. Don't don't come over to Sparta because you'll die. They want they wanted that, but you know to to get at the Spartans, um, you know you've got to be tricky. Obviously, you know traveling Laconia, the 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 province that, that Sparta is in, has, has been a great boon of mine. I lived in Greece for about three years, so I spent a lot of time in and around Sparta and in and around Greece and Italy and Turkey. So I've traveled those areas pretty extensively. But there's also a field of studies called ethnography, which is the study of uh, of culture. So what you can do with ethnography is you can um, look for other similar traits in other cultures. And when you don't understand one culture properly or how that, that event came about, you can look through ethnography to other cultures and what might have precipitated such an event in the culture you don't know too much about. So for the Spartans, uh, you can use there's certain uh, cities or polis on Crete that had similar sorts of mess hall dining and um, you know the raising of their children and things like that. And even interestingly enough, some of the... Uh, Aboriginal cultures here here in Australia have also been used through ethnography to sort of understand the way Spartans were uh, with their their pederastic relationships between older men and younger boys. So yeah, there's there's definitely a few fields you can do. So the, the measuring of the topography, the understanding of the geography, uh, obviously the history texts. You know, if there's any inscriptions and monuments that you can use. Obviously, using other people's history to try and understand you know what occurred at that particular time. And through ethnography, you can start to you know get at the idea of what you know really happened in ancient Sparta, for example. This might seem like a dumb question, but do you think the Spartans actually matter to history? Absolutely. No, it's not a dumb question at all. No, I think, um, I mean, uh, I didn't coin the phrase, but my my historian hero, Professor Paul Cartledge, who is the you know the greatest living expert on Sparta, he, he says that the, the Battle of Thermopylae or the Greco-Persian Wars more extensively, which, you know, which were won by and large by the Spartans, the Athenians, 
definitely contributed, you know, a fair amount, especially on the, on the naval side of things. But this, the, the Persians need to be beaten on land, and it was the Spartans who beat them there. He calls that the birth cry of Western civilization. And what he means by that is if the Greeks hadn't have stopped the Persians there, there was no end to where they could have gone. You know, Roman, the Roman Empire well, wasn't an empire. You know, Rome was a, a very nascent republic at that stage. You know, there would have been nothing to stop the Persians going west, you know, and, and who knows what history might look like today. Certainly Western history, our history would look vastly different than what it does now. You know, if they had a snuffed out the Athenian democracy before it really got going in the 480s and they've swashed Sparta before they could have, um, you know, risen to real preeminence, preeminence, which happened after the Greco Persian Wars and completely wiped Rome off the face of this earth. While, you know, at the time of the Greco Persian Wars, Rome had only been a republic for 30 years and it controlled no territory. It was just one city. They were nothing, absolutely nothing. So, yeah, for sure. It's not a stupid question at all. The Spartans were pivotal. What's the so what's the symbolism for Sparta? Like when you would look at the public's perception of what they would think of when they first think of Sparta compared to what you've learned through your history deep dives. I would think a spear. I think yeah, I was, I, for some reason when you asked me that question, I thought of a wolf. Uh and 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 the wolf motif is is um is very prominent in Sparta. I mean the Laconia, which is the the province um, where the Spartans came from, it, it means wolfish or from the wolf. Their their spiritual founder, like Kyrgyz, means uh, wolf worker or wolf walker. For example, the wolf was is one of those creatures, you know, that it, it it's silent. Yeah, you know, it's a killer. It can never be underestimated. You can never turn your back on it. You know, it's it's there in the night. It's there in the dawn. Uh, I think the, the the wolf is the for me anyway. That's the that's the one that sort of comes to mind. I've never had that question before, to be honest. Well, that's my job. Um, no. <laughs> when it comes to materialistic possessions, do you think the Spartans were materialistic? I don't think I asked you that yet. Uh, they were. Yeah, they were. Now, there was, like Hergus, so I just mentioned, um, you know, he was sort of quasi mythical. Some of his uh, his retra, his laws were around uh, opulence and and the removal of opulence throughout, throughout Sparta. But yeah, definitely. They, I mean, they, you know, they raced horses, you know, that was a, that was a noble pursuit. You know, they, they won chariot races at the Olympic games, you know, they, they had land, you know, they, there was always the Spartans that, that had, you know, there was the, the haves and the have nots, you know, they weren't as, you know, I guess externally wealthy as the, the Athenians were, but that was, that was the Athenians who practiced conspicuous consumption, but this, the Spartans, you know, you, you get the impression that, you know, inside their houses, inside their little, you know, stone houses, they, they would have been quite wealthy in there, but externally, they all appeared equal, and that was the idea of the the Spartans, the homoioi, the, the the ancient Laconian or ancient Greek word for the Spartans. Homoioi means similars, um, and they were all similar in a sense that they were all entitled to fight in a Spartan army, and they were all entitled to dine in collective mess halls. But that's where the similarities ended. They were definitely haves and have-nots in Sparta. How much of that myth making of Sparta was kind of destroyed or crumbled down a little bit when you started learning more about who they, I mean, I have a bigger respect for them knowing that all the things that you've taught me um, over the podcast we've done, but, you know, from the myth of like this, these brutal savages, you know, either whether it was to deter enemies or anything like that, I would just have to think that if you're diving into it and learning more, you would start to see the myth crumble a little bit, realize that this actually has a little bit more weight or some more, I don't know, grain to it has a little bit more to it. Yeah, I mean, like uh, people always ask me. I think you asked me in our first episode, like, you know, what do I think about Frank Miller's three hundred? You know, I, I love it. You know, like, I mean, that is how, in my in my mind, anyway, not you know, not to that degree, but that's how the ancient Greeks, people who would have heard of Sparta, heard of what they did at Thermopylae, heard of what they did at Plataea, that's how they would have thought of the Spartans. You know, like the the myth making was was so so prevalent in those days. You know, you you were living with legends. You know, the very gods walked the earth. With the with the Greeks, and that that was that was how everybody else would have thought of them. Within Sparta, that's that's a tough one to get at. You know, we 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 know almost nothing about the Spartans, but we certainly know that they were they were propagandists. There's a series of of, of sayings that have come down to us that were recorded uh, allegedly over time and and coalesced in a work by by um by Plutarch. And and in these sayings, you know, these are just, just pithy aphorisms that, you know, would have been said at different courts and different diplomatic meetings and things like that. But, you know, the Spartans were pretty aware, you know, they had some some pretty cool sayings. They, they, were, they were a country of great, great one-liners. And to speak laconically, even in this day and age, it's more of an academic term. But when you speak laconic, laconically, you speak, um, you say a lot with very little and they're very, it's very sharp. To give an example, when Philip of Macedon uh, 
was threatening Sparta. This is long since Sparta had been a preeminent force, but yeah, they still had their had their attitude. And he sent a letter to the Spartans saying, if I come to Sparta, I will burn it to the ground. And the Spartans sent back a one word reply. And it was, if. That's just how they were. You know, they just had this sort of this, this hard assness about them. Is now based on the 300 movie, you said you enjoyed that movie, but is that pit real? Like they didn't have a pit, did they? Yeah, they did. Uh, they did actually. Um, <laughs> funnily that. enough, they had they had two pits, I guess. Yeah. Um, well, so for all one gets full. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, one was apparently where they threw the the deformed boys, um, because the first rite of passage for a Spartan male was to be as a baby was to be examined by the ephorate, the elders. And if they if they cried, if they shied away, if they were in any way deformed, they were discarded. Um, yeah, and there's some contention around whether or not that happened. But there is a place not far from Sparta where um, they found a like sort of a, a natural chasm in the rock where there was an earthquake of some description and there's a big hole. And they found at the bottom of that number of skeletons. Now, no no children. So they, they think perhaps that they just, you know, they chucked prisoners of war down there or criminals down there. But there was a place where they threw people to get rid of them. And famously, when, when Darius first sent ambassadors to Sparta and they demanded the customary tokens of, of earth and water in jars, <laughs> the Spartans threw them down a well, telling them they'll get plenty of earth and water down there. So, yeah, they, you know, that's, that's semi-true. Can you imagine being a prisoner and they're like, hey, where are we going? Oh, we're going to the castle. It's like, oh, shit. I know what he's going to do with me. <laughs> you just know at that point, that's a long fucking walk. Yeah, yeah. Well, the Athenians had one too. The Athenians had a lime pit. So, you know, obviously lime will just dissolve. You know, if you want to, you know, not giving away any ideas to your listeners here, but if you want to get rid of a body, you can chuck it in a bathtub full of lime and it'll emulsify. The, the Athenians had lime pits very close to the Acropolis. The Persian ambassadors that went there got chucked in in the lime pits as well. So that's how the Persians and the Athenians both ticked off the uh, the great king over there in Persia. Now, so when they sent that messenger in 300 and he gets kicked in the hole, was that a normal thing that they did to every single civilization? Did every civilization respond with the same action of pushing them in a hole or putting getting rid of the messenger or were there acceptance to it? Because the Persians seemed like they just wanted to wipe everybody out. And I don't know why if don't, some, someone threw a first stone first or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, actually, no, the Athenians and the Spartans were the only two people who did that. Um, you know, when it came down to the crunch out of a thousand Greek cities, uh, only 31 of them uh, decided to fight the Persians. And and if Sparta and Athens hadn't, you know, gotten rid of the, the royal ambassadors, none of them would have. The entire nation of Greece would have medized, as they as they say, uh, which medized means to go over to Persia. And and Greece just would have been another, uh, you know, Persian satrapy. The Persians had no interest in coming to Greece, but, you know, they, they, they were so infuriated and dishonored by what the Spartans and the Athenians did to them that they had no choice if they were to save face and save royal honor and, and to keep everybody else under the thumb because you know what would what would western turkey the who, who had a who were greeks as well asian minor greeks what would they do if you know, they they saw the persians you know get beaten around by the spartans anything as they'd rise up and revolt too and you know egypt was always ready to revolt babylonia was always ready to revolt the persians had no choice but to go over there and you know stamp out the the crazy greeks who were spurning them so it's pretty similar in the aspect that how much they care about respect and credibility. Like how many moves back then were based on respect and credibility. Like, you know, if you get slighted a certain way, you can't just look like a chump to, you know, an army of whatever, a couple hundred. You have to go over there and try and show how strong you are. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll, tell, I'll show you an interesting story. So when the, when the Persian ambassadors came uh, in the 490s and the Spartans, you know, did away with their ambassadors by throwing them down the well. Years later, when so that was that was under Darius or Darius. Um, years later, when his son Xerxes was coming back to finish the job, the Spartans were in, were in a real tiz. They're like, "Well, what are we going to do? You know, we we can't fight the Persians. You know, we've got our own problems here at home." And two Spartans, um, I believe, I believe the two Spartans that actually participated in throwing these people down the well, they sacrificed themselves up to absolve Sparta. Uh, of the of the pollution because diplomatic embassies were were under the protection of the gods. To throw two Persian ambassadors down a well was a uh, was invoking the the ire of the gods. So the Spartans felt that they had a had a pollution that they needed to be cleansed. So these two Spartans went all the way from Sparta, all the way to Persepolis uh, in in Persia, which was a trek of some ninety to one hundred and twenty days, and they threw themselves at the feet. Of Xerxes and begged for his mercy and offered their lives up. And Xerxes rejected them, saying that you know. Unlike the Spartans, 
we have honor here in Persia. And they sent them back all the way back to, to Sparta. So it was then that the Spartans were like, well, Christ, we're going to have to fight now. Where did they get their weaponry from? Uh, so the Spartans had a, had a well, for, for many people it was different. The Spartans had a, had a, uh, a tiered society. So the homoioi at the top were the, the red cloak Spartans that we talk about. Then the, the halots were at the bottom of that tiered structure. In the middle were a classification of people called the perioikoi. And perioikoi means the dwellers around. So these were the, the people that, that weren't enslaved that weren't full class citizens, but they, they had a modicum of freedom. They lived amongst the Spartans, hence the term dwellers around, and they were artisans. Um, they were tradesmen. They were, you know, farmers and things like that as well. They, they were free. They, they actually paid um, through service to the Spartans. And when the 5,000 Spartan full homoioi marched off to, to fight the Persians at Plataea, 5,000 perioikoi hoplites also accompanied the Spartans there along with the 35,000 slaves at the same time. So that's where the Spartans got theirs from. But blacksmiths and, and weapon makers um, were abound in ancient Greece. It was a family tradition that was passed down through generations. I'm just curious where they got their resources from because I understand where the making of it comes, but I mean, were a lot of people on trips, were they sending people out to trips to go look for resources? They just strike me as a largely military moving civilization not something that would be looking like hey we need to go find some copper we need to go find this you know i was wondering who was doing that for them well well we're talking about the iron age here now to be fair um there were still uh, a number of things that were made of of bronze and bronze consisted of uh copper and tin um most of the copper in the mediterranean came from an island called cyprus the the ancient name for cyprus was indeed copper Kipro. Um, and, and tin was fairly, fairly common. It was, um, you know, generally found in deposits on the ground. It wasn't too hard to get iron on the other hand, once that was, you know, they could discover how to get temperatures hot enough to be able to smell iron. Iron was everywhere. That was, that was readily abundant. Um, so, you know, the Mediterranean was, was, was nothing but filled with trade. You know, you had, you had copper coming in from the East. You had Greek textiles and olive and jars moving out, uh, out to the east and then copper coming back from the east to the west. So there was a, an intricate trade network that was in there that was that was always, you know, undergoing and traders, you know, they, they had a free right of passage. So it wasn't like the Persia, it wasn't like Persia was stopping that from happening. Did they have an open agreement like with trade of using someone that, if they got weapons from somewhere else? Like, or did it specifically have to be made in Sparta? Like there, I would have to think you could only trust the people, especially how close knit they were. They would only trust the people that they knew that make their weapons for them. I wondered about open. It seems like it would be illegal for Spartans to do that, like trying to accept, I don't know, any type of resource or anything. Oh, that, that you want to trade this copper for this? We can't accept that because I can't put those into my weapons. But it has to be Sparta made, it has to be handmade Sparta, even if it's the resources as well, too. Because it makes me ask the question, what about if silk or anything do we have or any information if it landed in Sparta or not? Where did they get that from? Who was trading with the Spartans to be able to get that? Yeah, well, well, silk, silk didn't come around for um, specifically. Silk didn't come around for for a few hundred years uh, after that. But um, for the for, for for let's take any Greek warrior, any hoplite. So the hoplite were the you know they were the enfranchised male citizens um, of all the various polis. You know they they were wealthy, um, and they had the, the term hoplite comes from the panoply, the the pan panoply of of weaponry that they had. You know, so they usually had a, a bronze cuirass, they had a you know a bronze helmet that was sort of you know beaten into shape out of sort of one sheet. They might have bronze greaves and bronze shin guards. They would have a spear that was made um, with an iron tip and had a bronze, um, what was called a sorata, which means uh, lizard killer, which we stick it in the ground with, used to kill lizards with it, and they have a, an, an iron sword. So they weren't they weren't churning and burning a lot of these items, you know, like you would have your, your weapon from, you know, young adulthood and you'd probably carry your arms and armor with you throughout combats. The things that you needed to renew would have been the, the timber shaft for the spear, for example, which you know the the ash timber was was fairly um, synonymous with the actual landscape around there. It was it was ubiquitous. That was everywhere. And leather straps, you know, and they were killing animals and they were tanning hides. So the perishables were were fairly easy sought after. But the actual hardware itself, it wasn't like you know a, a modern army that needs to be able to have you know facilities to build missiles and and you know bullets and manufacturers for that sort of thing. Things weren't that much needed to be replaced now and the 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 number of troops wasn't like they called up a bunch of extra troops the number of troops was always a known factor in ancient greece so it wasn't supply regarding arms and armor wasn't that tricky in that regard were they able to pick up an item from maybe a fallen soldier or do they bury them with that oh no no well yeah a, a little bit of both you know uh, 
we, we have found burials um, that have, you know, certain arms and armor, certainly the, the royalty, the tombs that we found in royalty were buried with arms and armor. But, but for the most part, you know, you take a, a large battle like, um, like Plataea um, and all of the corpses were stripped following that battle, you know, and they built monuments out of these, um, and in a lot of cases out of like all the brass and all the bronze or the copper. Um, so very few people were, were buried those armors, but I mean, they used what was to hand. Take Thermopylae, for example, uh, on the third day, Herodotus writes that the Spartans were using, you know, broken arrow shafts, broken spear shafts, shields, helmets, their their hands and their nails to, to kill up the enemy. So it wasn't like, oh, we, you know, we, we can't use that. It's a perfectly, you know, um, good weapon sitting out there. Well, they better just use whatever was to hand and that sorts of instance, you know. The reason I asked all these questions was because I was wondering if somebody was trading with the Spartans, then wouldn't it be much simpler if the, whoever was fighting the Spartans could just find who they were trading with and tell them that they had to cut off like an embargo type deal, an early stage embargo. And that would have been a thousand times easier than trying to deal with the strength of the Spartans. So it's interesting to know that there wasn't like that kind of angle that they could go at, which is, I think, also what makes Sparta kind of more solidified. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. You don't you don't get that in history where they're you know they're cutting off the supply of you know this given mineral. The, the main thing that you read about in history that they're cutting off is generally you know water heads. supply. Heads. Yeah, heads. <laughs> that helps too. You know that's that's usually the last stage. Yeah, I mean you know the food supply like the you know the grain supply from Egypt that that was getting cut off. You know in, in Roman times that was always a bit of a bit of a nightmare for Rome and um, yeah cutting off water supplies to starve starve cities out dehydrate cities out that was common but not sort of you know because things were so slow and so progressive, like, you know, these days we, we look at battles and wars and they can happen over, you know, a rather condensed period of time. But you look at the Peloponnesian War, you know, this is a war that took 32 years to, to complete. You know, things happen in fits and starts. You know, there's always cessations of hostilities and incredibly, you know, war times are generally, you know, very aggressive war times interposed in there too. So war in, in the ancient world was was different as we understand it these days. Do you ever wonder why Sparta didn't expand into another civilization? Like just have a smaller one off to the side in case they ever lost their main home. Yeah, they they, they tried, um, especially following the the Greco Persian Wars and also following the the Peloponnesian War when they eventually brought Athens to its knees and um, had them submit to Spartan hegemony. And that was part of the thing that ruined the Spartans. You know, they started bringing all this all this wealth and all this opulence and luxury within Sparta. And they no longer wanted to spend, you know, 20 years in their barracks with other men. And they no longer wanted to live lives of austerity and starvation and privation. You know, they, they wanted to find things in life. You know, they they, they, they softened themselves. And, and this is what happens to, to most great civilizations. It happened to Rome as well. You know, like in, if you look at... Um, even our civilizations, it, it happens in, in modern times too. You know, we the middle class gets wealthy. You know, the the upper class, you know, obviously gets wealthier, wealthier still. And nobody really wants to do the hard things anymore. You know, if you look at um, take take my country for example, if you look at you know what who defends the borders in this country and the borders these days are, are customs. You know, they're 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 people that have come from overseas for the most part. You know, the people that that control the transportation. They're people that come from overseas, you know, because the Australians don't want to do those jobs anymore, you know, and that's what happened to the Romans. The Romans didn't want to fight in the army anymore. They didn't want to go out and conquer for the emperor, the Spartans too. They weren't interested in that anymore. They wanted to live the cushy life. And, and that's generally what happens to, to most great societies over time. They they get this antipathy towards uh, hard work. They get this antipathy towards, you know, any sort of privation. They just want things easy. And that's sort of, that's what happened to Sparta. It's like a stage of it's like burnout, isn't it? It seems like a lot like burnout. Yeah, well, it's just you know, it's, it's you hear it from your, your parents. You're like, oh, back in my day, you know, we were walking to school through eight foot of snow and barefoot and broken glass. You know, it was always, it's always, and it's always the idea you want to give your kid. I want for for my son, you know, I want him to have a great life, to a better life than I had, and I had a great life. But it's just natural that that things, you know, I think you know, Joe Rogan has that saying. I don't know where he gets it from. Where is like you know, hard times make you know make good times, make soft men or something. I can't remember how he actually puts it together, but it, but it's true. You know, life is life in empires and civilizations are cyclical in nature. It's hard times make good men. Good men make easy times. Easy easy times make soft I don't know, something soft like that. Yeah, yeah, soft, soft men. men. No, soft you're right. Men. You're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He says like it all that. the time. I should have I shouldn't know. Yeah. Yeah.
But uh, no, Steve, now I appreciate the time you gave me to talk on my show and talk about this and staying up a little bit for me to be able to talk about some of the things I had questions on. Like I said, I was looking through a lot of this ritualistic stuff that started going down into the ancient times. And then I came across the Rome Coliseum and I was looking at the Rome Coliseum and I was like, well, I got to learn more about this thing. And we talked a little bit about that and obviously about Spartan stuff too, because that's just fascinating in its own. Uh, but where can people find your podcast, man, and any other links you'd like to promote? Yeah, mate, it's just, um, yeah, www.spartanhistorypodcast.com. That's where you find me if you want to email me. Uh, yeah, it's, it's um, Spartan History Podcast at Hotmail, and I'm on Twitter at Spartan underscore history. I'm going to link those in the description. Thanks, everybody, for listening to this episode of Power the Blank. Stay tuned for our next episode.